I, I love the line at the end there that if Amy Comey Barrett is the one that replaces Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Trump would be opposing her legacy. Y yeah. What's your point? Any candidate that he would nominate would be opposing Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy. Because President Trump, I mean, presumably is not going to be nominating somebody that would be similar to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ergo, that would be an opposition of her legacy. This is what's supposed to happen. The people elected President Trump, not entirely, but partly on the idea that he would be nominating Supreme Court justices that are not like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. So after we found out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had passed, Newsweek had to actually print a retraction because one of their attacks went way too far and turns out that it wasn't actually based on anything, not unlike the CNN article that we just took a look at. So originally they had claimed that Amy Comey Barrett belonged to a group of what they call charismatic Catholics. It's just a, a group that gets together. They're a group that gets together and talks about Christians, uh, Christianity, the Bible, and they sort of hold one another accountable, that kind of thing. Th that's really all it is. It's basically a, a small group or a social club, something like that, but they have a larger infrastructure, and they're referred to as the people of praise. So Newsweek originally claimed in this article that they put out that was a hit piece and trying to smear Amy Comey Barrett that the group was the inspiration for The Handmaid's Tale. But... It turns out that that was not the case, but originally this whole article claimed that she was a part of this group and they were the inspiration for the hands made tale. If you don't know what that is, you know, you, you're one of the blessed ones because it is such a, it is such a piece of garbage as far as media goes. I mean, it's basically just how the work, I, I will say this, it is useful for this. It gives you insight into the way that the left thinks that the right actually is. Like if you were to create a caricature of what a, a deeply secular leftist believes Christians are actually like and, and how, how the world would actually look if Christians were running it, you can actually go to The Handmaid's Tale, and, and they think that if Mike, Prince, uh, Mike Pence were dictator of the world, that that's the way that he would have the world look. Completely untrue, of course, but it is valuable, if nothing else, for that. As far as a story, it's, it's completely useless. So, anyway... The author of The Handmaid's Tale, the book that wound up eventually being made into an Amazon Prime series, uh, they claimed that this group was the basis for that, and here were some of the claims that they put out there. First of all, they claimed that the female members are forced to report to their spiritual superiors known as, quote, handmaids, that's where the name The Handmaid's Tale comes from, and the group stresses that, quote, men have authority over their wives. <gasps> oh my goodness. Men have authority over their wives? What kind of crazy religious cult is this? Well, it's not a religious cult. That's something that's actually found in the book of Ephesians and several other places, is that part of the marriage contract is that men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which means they are willing to give of themselves, to do things for their wives, to give of themselves, even their own lives if that's re what's required, and that women, because of that, are also to be in subjection to their husbands. It doesn't mean they have to do everything they do or they're not allowed to speak their mind or anything like that, but it does mean that a man has final say and he has authority over matters because he has been appointed the head of the household by God. That's part of very orthodox mainstream Christian beliefs. There are very, very few strains of Christianity that do not teach this. I, I don't, I'm honestly not aware of any, but I want to hedge my language just in case there might be some Christian groups out there that teach that that's incorrect. So uh, that, that's a very, very mainstream Christian belief. And here's the thing, not only is that rooted in scripture, of course it is, but the other thing is rooted in scripture too. Referring to yourself as a handmaid, it is a sign of humility and it is something that women that follow God have done for centuries. This even predates the New Testament. You can look at, for example, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She refers to herself, herself as a handmaid when she is told by Gabriel that she is going to conceive and, and bear Jesus. She refers to herself as a handmaid in a prayer to God. Uh, you can also see Hannah, who is Samuel's mother, the, the mother of the prophet. 
that she refers to herself as a handmaid as well. Abigail, one of the wives of David, she refers to herself as a handmaid when she is going before David and asking him to spare her then-husband's life, which he winds up actually doing. And then you also have Elizabeth, who is the mother of John the Baptist. She's also referred to as a handmaid by Mary, actually. Mary calls her a handmaid as well. And then you have Ruth, who refers to herself as a handmaid. She, of course, being the great-grandmother of King David and, and the namesake of the Book of Ruth. And so this is something that happens, and there's probably several other examples. These were just the ones that I came up with off the top of my head. There's several, several examples in the Scripture of women referring to themselves as handmaids, merely suggesting that they are servants to God and in subjugation to Him. It is a sign of humility. By the way, men do this too. They don't refer to themselves as handmaids, obviously, but it is very common in the Scripture to see man referring to God as, Thy servant heareth. Something like that. Samuel, you know, who's the heinous son, who we just talked about. Whenever he is first called by God, he says, Yes, Lord, your servant heareth. Men typically refer to themselves as servants. Women refer to themselves as servants or handmaids. It's sort of a, just a, a synonym for that. And so this is very, very common within the Scripture, not outside the Orthodox at all. Uh, why that group uses it, I don't know. I guess it's just flowery language, just you know, something for aesthetic appeal, but it's not something that's weird or out of the norm for Christianity. But it turns out, even if that were something to be feared, and even if that were something to, to be ashamed of, that this group was the inspiration for The Handmaid's Tale, which is ridiculous on a number of levels, that it turns out that wasn't even the right group. So Newsweek got this completely wrong, and they had to issue a correction. So you can see here, this is Newsweek offering their correction. This article's headline originally stated that the people of praise inspired The Handmaid's Tale. The book's author, Margaret Atwood, has never specifically mentioned the group as being the inspiration for her work. The note read, quote, A New Yorker profile of the author from 2017 mentions a newspaper clipping as a part of her research for the book of a different charismatic Catholic group, People of Hope, Newsweek regrets the error. So they did somewhat get in the ballpark by saying that there is a charismatic Christian group that does this, but it ain't the one that Amy Comey Barrett. It's so ridiculous. They want this to be true so badly you can taste it. You can also tell from that quote that one of the things that they say, she never specifically mentioned it, sort of implying that the group could have been inspiration for it. Yeah, but it wasn't. And you guys are supposed to be a news publication. Now, granted, I, you gotta hand it to them. At least they actually did issue the correction. A lot of news organizations would have probably seen that mistake, not issued a correction, and just pretended like it never happened. Newsweek at least did have the stones to admit that they screwed up and didn't do their homework, and because of that, they attributed this to a group that it shouldn't have ever been attributed to because it simply was not the case. You would think that a journalistic organization would not be this sloppy. Everybody makes mistakes. I get it. But why would a journalistic organization print this to be true even though they never found actual evidence for it? Just because the names were similar? Was it just an honest mistake? I don't think so. See, here's what happened. They wanted it to be true. Because people on the left, like I said, th that's how they, The Handmaid's Tale and the dystopian future that it portrays in this fiction novel, that's how they see Christianity. Therefore, since that fits into their worldview, they wanted so bad for this story to be true, they could taste it. And so because of that, they just kind of found something that sort of tangentially connects in a very, you know, obscure way the group that Amy Comey Barrett belongs to, to The Handmaid's Tale, and they're like, oh, we got to run with this. They wanted the story to be true, which is the reason that they were in such a rush to get it out there before actually doing their research and determining whether or not what they did was true. And if you want further proof of this, if you want to know how I know that this is the case, this is the reason that they did this, all you have to do is look at the headline and how they changed it. This is after they issued the correction. How charismatic Catholic groups like Amy Comey Barrett's People of Praise inspired The Handmaid's Tale. 
So even though this article is based off of a premise that is completely 100% false, that is not even, there's not a kernel of truth to it whatsoever, they kept it on their website, and the only thing they changed, they changed a few things in the article itself and did issue the correction after it. But the only thing they changed was, well, it's groups like the one Amy Comey Barrett. They're still trying really hard to connect her to The Handmaid's Tale. Now, again, it wouldn't bother me even if she was a part of the group that inspired The Handmaid's Tale because it's fiction, it's not real. Which is something that these people don't seem to really comprehend. But it's not a real thing. Therefore, it wouldn't bother me if the woman, just because the women are referred to as handmaids and happen to be very devoted Catholics, it would not bother me if that was the inspiration. Because that's not a representation of what we actually are or what we actually believe. So, I don't really care if that was the inspiration. If I were in that group. Of course, I'm not. But even if it were true, Newsweek wants this to be uh, to be the case so badly that they are willing to just, ba just you know issue the correction, but do as soft a walk back as humanly possible and say, well, you know, it it's it's like that group. It's just another example of of journalism gone completely awry. Uh, another example of this, and this one's really funny as well. This was from uh, Yahoo Life. This is Amy Comey Barrett, the potential RBG replacement who hates your uterus. I swear this is a real headline. I'm not making this up. This isn't a Babylon B spoof of what a leftist or organization would put up there. That's what they actually said. So, And there's quite a few gems in here. But before we even get into the article, do these people not understand what a uterus does? They get that the purpose of the uterus, it's a reproductive organ, right? The, the, the whole reason that women have it is for procreation. That's, that's why it exists. And so, of course, the reason that they're saying this is because potentially, we don't know this for sure, but based on everything that we can read about her, Amy Comey Barrett seems to be very pro-life and thinks that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. Which, you know, is part of one of the reasons that I'd really love to have her as a Supreme Court Justice. Not the only one, but definitely pretty high on the list. But anyway, that's why they're putting that claim out there that she hates your uterus because she's against abortion. Well, the purpose of the uterus is to create more people and abortion ends that. That doesn't make any sense. I mean... That, that would be like, I don't, I don't know, it would, it, it's hard to even come up with something that would equate to that. It, it, it's saying that she wants your uterus to be used for the purpose for which it was intended. And it's not like Amy Comey Barrett is going out there and impregnating women, you know, and forcing them to give birth. She's just saying that they shouldn't be able to kill the baby living inside their uterus if they do happen to get pregnant. That's not the same thing. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, to put it in terms, that would be like Amy Comey Barrett saying uh, uh, she, she hates apple trees because she wants them to grow apples. That, what? That doesn't make any sense. It's fulfilling the purpose that it's there for. And she's not saying that you even have to procreate. She's just saying that, you know, that, that process should not be stopped once it starts because there's a person living in there. I, their rationale just is all over the place. Here's a little excerpt from this particular article. But Barrett's positions on abortion stem from her personal background and strong religious beliefs. <gasps> In 2002, she joined her Catholic University, because remember, she's a Notre Dame graduate. Uh, she joined her Catholic University's faculty. At the time, fellow uh, educators actively opposed ideas of secularization, especially in the Supreme Court's 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling. So the Catholic woman wants Notre Dame to stay Catholic? Yeah, that is scandalous. Good job, Yahoo Life. Excellent digging going on there that the Catholic wants Notre Dame to stay a Catholic school. Ooh, they've got her now. That doesn't make any sense. I guess this is just them doing their job. They view this as front-page news. This, to them, is something that is, is scandalous and uh, worthy of note. 
continues on, Life begins at conception, she told Notre Dame Magazine, who also described Barrett's view on Roe v. Wade as, quote, creating through a judicial fiat a framework of abortion on demand. For her part, Barrett is a practicing Roman Catholic and mother of seven. She is well known throughout conservative circles for putting her religious convictions at the forefront of her work and identity. Quote, her religious convictions are pro-life and she believes in those convictions, said U.S. District Judge Patrick J. Schiltz. Schiltz? Who's one of her mentors? This is pretty standard stuff for a Christian. I mean, Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. This is something that, that comes very, very standard with Christianity. And the difference, I will say that one thing that is probably causing a hiccup here is if you see the world the way the left does, and if you view the courts the way that the left does, they don't see any difference in what they believe that they should interpret the law as and what they believe that the law ought to be. So if you've got two circles here and you're trying to create a Venn diagram for somebody on the left, what I want the law to say and what I think that the law does say as far as my interpretation of it, that's just a circle. Whoop, messed up my microphone there. That's just a circle. You're not, there's no distinction between those two things. Now, a conservative may say, here's what I wish that the law said, but I'm going to interpret it this way because this is what the law actually says. See, that's what a textualist does. And so you can kind of see, even though it's ridiculous because their stance, of course, originates from ridiculousness, but you kind of understand why a leftist is a little bit freaked out about this because they look at that and are saying to themselves, well, if there was a leftist on the court that believed these things, then that's how they would interpret the law. Well, yeah, a leftist would, because they have no commitment to the original meaning of the law. A person that has an originalist, textualist point of view looks at the law and says, well, it doesn't really matter what I believe. This is what the law was intended to say. Ergo, this is how I'm going to rule on it. Justice Scalia famously did this in the burning of the flag case that happened back in, what was it, the late 80s, early 90s, something like that, where they brought a case before him and the rest of the justices and said, yeah, here's a case of somebody burning a flag. Can we make that illegal? And he said, no, you can't make that illegal. That's part of free speech. I don't like it. I think it's stupid. I don't think you should do it. But just because I believe that the law should be you can't burn a flag doesn't mean that the law says you can't burn a flag. Sometimes you're going to make decisions that simply you do not like or you don't even agree with yourself. I, I love the line at the end there that if Amy Comey Barrett is the one that replaces Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Trump would be opposing her legacy. Y yeah. What's your point? Any candidate that he would nominate would be opposing Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy. Because President Trump, I mean, presumably is not going to be nominating somebody that would be similar to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ergo, that would be an opposition of her legacy. This is what's supposed to happen. The people elected President Trump, not entirely, but partly on the idea that he would be nominating Supreme Court justices that are not like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so this is what's supposed to happen. In the same way, I didn't like it, but when President Obama nominated the most liberal justice on the court, Sonia Sotomayor, or put forward Elena Kagan, I didn't like that, and that is not something that President George W. Bush would have done. Was Obama opposing W. Bush's legacy? Yeah, he was. That's what's supposed to happen. The American people rejected W. Bush's legacy. And they said, you know what, we'd rather have this guy that is very different from President George W. Bush. And then he appointed Supreme Court justices in a very different way than George W. Bush did. That's what it means to win an election. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, 
and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.